Good evening. All right, welcome to our Bible study this evening. You need to get as many people as you can to come and be a part of this study tonight. I need you to get your paper and your pencil or you get your, you take notes on your phone or you take notes on your tablet, whichever way you do it. What I'm talking about this evening is essential. For the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about, I think, the elephant in the room. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the forest, the tree in the forest that you can't see. You know, people say you can't see the tree for the forest. The most essential power that God gave the believer is the power of faith. We talk around it. We live around it. We all act like we know it. And yet people are suffering every day. I'm talking to you. I want to teach you this evening. We're going to be doing a study, and it takes me back to my early, early days of, of ministry when I first started uh, in ministry as a minister some 30 years ago. And it takes me back to that, to know that I spent all of my time in this topic because it has not dissipated. It is still what we need. If you're losing, if you're suffering, listen to me today. You ought to hear this, and it's very simple, and you're going to say, Man, there's a whole lot of people teaching that. Yes, but we need to get it down to a bare bones teaching and start applying it. I'm going to talk about tonight, of course, living by faith. But the title is how to put your faith into action. That's the part that should excite you. I found myself many a time with all I know about the Bible. And as long as I've been preaching, I have to consciously and intentionally put my faith into action or whatever situation I'm in will overcome me. So I want to teach you tonight how to put your faith into action and to understand that most, most of us do not. Before we do anything, let's pray. While you get some more folk, share this message, get it out there, let them know it's on tonight. Come on, somebody your life could depend on what we're talking about right now because I'll tell you many a times my life has depended on this. There's somebody you're praying with right now. There's somebody you're believing healing for. There's somebody you're, there's some things you're believing God for. Well, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about how to put your faith into action. It's not emotional. It's not just shouting. It's not just jumping. You feel better after all of that, but that still is not putting your faith into action. Come on. We need to understand how to do this. So let's pray first. Father God, I thank you for allowing us to come together tonight, those that are listening, those of us, Lord, who find ourselves in a very dark world where we need your power and your presence. It's been said by Voltaire that um, if people have enough faith or in faith there is enough light that people can see it or enough darkness if people don't believe it. So we have to learn how to turn our faith on, make sure our faith is working. There is no power greater than the faith of God. The Bible says all things are possible if we believe. And tonight, Lord, we need to walk in that area of not seeing but believing by faith. So I thank you right now for what you're going to do and say in Jesus' name, amen. Grab your Bibles, of course, and go with me. To the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. That's going to be our stepping off point. And it'll explain where we're going. But also, of course, we're going to have to look at the rich, rich, rich book of Hebrews. Right? So let's look at this. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Now there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that talks about what we need to do to make our faith better or stronger that don't have the word faith in them, but they all are talking about how we believe and what we believe, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with how much? With all your heart. And lean not 
to your own understanding. This is about not you trying to understand what God can do. It's believing what God can do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It don't look good, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. I don't see it, but trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And all your ways, acknowledge every way. Acknowledge God and he will direct your path. Somebody needs to put that into practice right now. We got to start this off with that preposition. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Tough. Easier said than done. But let's start this way. There's a myth out, and we've all heard it, that we only use 10% of our brains, right? And that myth has been perpetuated because it is a myth. Uh, matter of fact, 65% of Americans in a 2013 survey believe that we don't use all of our brain. But so according to neurologist Barry Gordon, in his latest uh, testing and understanding of how we use our brain, he explained that all of our brain is being used at some point or another. How much of our brain do we use? All of our brain. Why? It's interesting because the brain is such a complex organ that men are still trying to study all the properties of, the, of our brain. But every part of our brain, if they were to do, uh, when they place our brain under a light and they look at it through a spectrum, they see that at some time, every part of our brain is being used for a different thing. Our brain is our control center. There's a hundred billion neurons and a uh, hundred trillion connections. Did you hear what I said? 100 billion neurons in your brain. It weighs three ounces in your head. I mean, three pounds in your head, but it has 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections. Uh, the brain, we talk about right brain, left brain, the right brain being that visual, creative, uh, intuitive part, and the left brain being that uh, analytical, verbal, orderly part. But the reality is all of our brain, all, you know, they, they divide it into the right brain and left brain because of the hemispheres and how our brain is shaped. But the brain itself is being used fully. How much of your brain do you use? All of it. Now, can we develop our brain for higher order thinking? Yes, we can. But we use all of our brain. Don't believe the myth. But the reason I'm talking about the brain is the same thing that is permeated the church about faith. People are always saying, I just need more faith. I just need to have more faith. Or I could get through this if I had more faith. Well, it's according to how you're using the word more, but that is not true. Every time you get into a situation, here's what you're doing. You're using all the faith you have. That's right. You're using all the faith you have at that particular moment. But here's the key. You can develop or grow more faith. But you don't get more faith. You can develop the faith that you have to function stronger. In other words, as the title of this message, you got to put your faith into action. Faith is like a muscle. You have to exercise it to make it grow. But the reality is Romans 12 and 3. Gives us the reality. Somebody out there saying, I'm going to be better next month because I'm going to have more faith. Or I'll be better next weekend. I'm going to make sure. No. You can grow or strengthen your faith. But watch this. Romans 12 and 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now let's explain that. Romans 12 and 3. People have used it wrongly. Look at the explanation. For I say through the grace given unto me for every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly. Here's what Paul is saying. If you know that this chapter of Romans, Paul starts this out as I beseech you brothers by the mercy of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, right? Those verses. Then he goes into after he says, which is your reasonable service, then he goes, for I say, through the grace giving me, stop. He said, through the grace of God given me, 
for the position that I hold as an apostle. Follow me. For the grace of God has made me who I am. So I shouldn't think of myself more highly than I ought to, but I ought to think soberly. Here it's saying, I need to understand that God has chosen me, saved me, placed in me a purpose. By his grace, he's made me a preacher. He's made you a believer. He's made you whatever an evangelist, whatever your title is, whatever your purpose is. But he said, but you need to understand something. The same way I gave you the grace to be, he said, according as God, God said, the way I make this happen is I give you the measure of faith. Not measured as we would say measuring how much. But what God is saying is the measure of faith is the ability to believe in me inexhaustibly. I control. I got enough faith in me now to believe any miracle I want. It, it's the measure means God said as soon as you become a believer, you have the measure of faith. Meaning I've given you enough faith, just you believing on me and the grace that I placed you in my body. I've given you enough faith to lay hands on yourself, to pray for someone else, to believe that what you can't see will happen, to sit there in pain but believe healing is still coming because you prayed for healing 10 minutes ago, to look at a situation that was negative and watch it get worse but say to yourself, I don't have to believe what I see. I only got to believe what I I only have to believe my faith. I have to believe what I said. I have to believe what God said. I have to believe what God is saying. I have to believe what God's word said. I have to make that word in my spirit and get my brain to register that I got all the faith I need. This is biblical. It's inexhaustible. You don't have to worry about getting more. You got to worry about growing it and putting it into action. Matthew 17, 17 explains this. You remember the text when the um, son, when, they, when Jesus came down off the Mount of Transfiguration and then the father came to Jesus and said, your disciples could not cast out the demon that's in my son. I, I did a whole series on this. And you understand this text. And Jesus said unto them, when he looked around at the scribes and the Pharisees and the crowd that was there. So when Jesus came down from Mount Transfiguration, there were people waiting there. And the father said, look, I need help from my son. Can you help him? And Jesus looked in Matthew 17, verse 17, and said, Then Jesus answered and said unto the disciples, unto all those religious leaders. See, we got a lot of folk, we're religious, and you're great at church. Oh, man, you can speak in tongues, you can waddle all over the floor, you can holler for two hours and come home and watch the devil take everything you have. I watch people. We go through the motions. We love performing. Uh, we, we love our titles. We love the pretense of, of being able to say, you know, I can prophesy. Yeah, but can you keep your anxiety level down? Can, can, you, can you lay down at night and sleep securely in your bed because you know God has got angels? Can you ride down the road and not let the stress overwhelm you? Now, a lot of this is contingent upon how you operate the faith that you have, putting it into action. Look what Jesus said to all the religious folks. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me, O oh ye of... Oh. He called them a faithless generation. So, either you have faith or you don't have faith. But if you have faith, you got enough faith. Does that make sense? Either you have faith or you don't have faith. The one thing you got to understand is you have to be the one who makes sure that your faith is working. Look at Matthew 8 and 10. Matthew 8 and 10. We're talking about the fact that you got to put your faith in action. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, Matthew 8 and 10, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Watch this. Here's what that verse said. Remember, Jesus had just uh, in healed and then uh, the centurion came and wanted healing for his servant, right? 
And when the centurion came in Matthew 8, wanting healing for his servant, he told Jesus, can you come, can you heal, come and heal my servant? Jesus said, I'll come heal him. And the man said, no, I don't need you to come. I am a man that has authority. I tell people to go, I tell people to come. I tell this one to do this, that one to do this, and they do it. Jesus, now watch what this man said, just speak the word. Oh, that's powerful. Is anybody watching me just understood that in the context and in the in, and where you're sitting at and in the context of your problem, do you make sure that the focus that I speak with is what did the word say? So I'm running out of money in the middle of that. I'm on my way to pay a bill or I'm going to the bank. I don't know if I'm going to get the loan. I'm trying to get a loan. I don't know where the money's coming from. But I prayed and I spoke a word over my situation before I got in the car. I said, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. I thought back on my giving. I give unto the Lord, and the Bible tells me in Luke 6, to give, and it shall be given. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto my bosom. Or I think about opening the windows. I think the word, watch this, by faith in that situation, and I let that word guide me. And that's what this man did. Somehow, this Gentile believer said, I believe all you have to do is speak. Do we believe that? This was a Gentile who said, all you have to do is speak the word, and I believe it's going to come to pass. And this Gentile believer said, that's what I need you to do. And in that process, Jesus was astounded and said, I've never seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. So we saw no faith, we saw great faith, and do you realize what we were talking about earlier? You can have little faith. Matthew 17, 20. He replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as a small as a mustard seed, this NIV, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. You have to understand a movement by faith. You know, I, I think sometimes when I'm talking to some of my long-term members, and we go back nostalgically to us building this church when we had a small number of members, we didn't have a lot of money, all we had was faith, nothing had been built down here in Port Norris, and I remember every move we made was by faith. And we talk about those times, and, and we look back on them, and somebody said to me, Pastor, my name is right up on that wall. Before they put the walls in, and when they poured the cement, before they put the floors down, we all wrote faith scriptures on the floors and faith scriptures on the wall because we didn't know where we were going to get $1.6 million. It was 1.2, then it ended up being, we needed another five, so it was $1.7 million the whole time. We didn't know where we were getting that from, but God, we believed it. And I think back, and I'm saying that because we wouldn't let anything deter us from believing that God was going to do what he says. That's putting your faith in action. The, the, I think that the roadblock, the, the, the stone, the wall in your way is, you have to understand, first of all, I got a measure of faith. I got inexhaustible in faith. As soon as I became a believer, God gave me the measure, meaning that now there's nothing possible. But I can, if I never believe, I have no faith. But I don't act on my faith. And then he said, I've seen great faith. When the man said, Jesus, just speak the word. Here in the same chapter of Matthew 17, with the father who had the son, that was with demonic and asked the disciples to pull, to ask to cast out the demon and he could not. Jesus replied unto them, because you have so little faith. I love this. The way the words are saying, it looks like you have a little by measure. But what he's saying is because you don't put the full measure 
the possibility, the capability of your faith into practice. You, we like to use our faith on little things, you know, little things where we can have a testimony. Yeah, and I know that was God, but have you used your faith, those words, right? Have you used your faith to build up a hopeless situation? Somebody in a coma for two months or somebody who's, um, whose situation is getting worse than it used to be. What God is saying is you got to put your faith into action because he ended up saying to the disciples when they came to him and said, why couldn't we cast it out? He said, you got a little faith. But then in Mark 9, 29, if you're writing this down, Mark 9, 29, he said unto them, this kind comes forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. We don't like that. I don't want to do that. Then you'll never get the blessing. You'll never get the miracle. This kind comes forth by prayer. All I'm saying to you is you have to exercise your faith. Faith in God. Now watch this. Faith in God is the most powerful force in the world. It changes things. It releases things. It builds things. It speaks things into existence. As you walk and every time you speak the word from a position of faith, things are built. Come on. Jesus called them perverse because we get into these perverse practices of just demanding miracles and doing things and laying stuff on God. God said this is going to happen. You got to be careful to just humble yourself and say, I'm going to let the force of this word come to pass. That's why I'm going to lay hands on myself. Nobody around. No, no, you know, pomp and circumstance. No crowd. I'm going to be in my house. And when the pain hits me or when the situation comes, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to speak words of faith. Somebody listening to me. Okay, you said, Pastor, I spoke them. Speak them again. Speak them again until you know it. Speak it until you believe it, just like you believe your name. Speak it until you believe it, just like if someone says, whose car is that outside? It's sitting in your driveway, and you say, that's my car. That my is emphasized. I know what I possess. Believer, I'm telling you to know what you possess and put it into action. There is no question. I was going to call this living by faith. We all think we're doing that. That's not what I want you to do. We all have to do that. God said in Hebrews 6, 11 and 6, which we're going to study this text from the, we're going to study this topic from the perspective of Hebrews 11, of course. But I want you to understand, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that come to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder out of them who diligently seek him, uh, out of them who say a prayer once and quit. No, diligently. Those who say it and expect results. No, diligently. Those who say it and don't want anything else bad to happen before they get their miracle. No, diligently. They may, co they may go under. They things may happen that you can't explain right after you pray, but your faith is not shaken because your faith is your saying to God, I believe you. When I come to you, I believe you. And I know you can do it. I think back to being a child. My parents promised us that we were going to Wildwood uh, one holiday. I don't know what it was. Fourth of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day. But, you know, it was one of those days as little kids and as children, you couldn't wait. So we put on our, you know, our nice little short sets. And we believed we'd get ready to go to Wildwood. But you know what happened? There was a demand on us before that. My parents had said, make sure you make your bed, clean your room, take care of that. Do you know that we were all happy? I guess my mom came in from the bank and my dad from somewhere, and they checked the house and said, you ain't going to Wildwood. No, you're not going. What? And we're mad at them. They're the meanest parents in the world. Why can't we go to Wildwood? And all of a sudden, the parents said, because you didn't make your bed. You didn't do what I asked you to do. That trip was the reward of you doing what you knew I could give you that trip, but you had to do what you needed to do in order to get the trip. Are you getting this? Here's the same thing God is saying. I can give you whatever you need, 
but you have to diligently seek me. You have to believe that what I'm saying is going to come to pass. You can't let your disappointments rule. You can't let what people say rule. You can't let other voices rule. You got to live by faith and understand that it's a powerful faith of belief in God. How many out there believe? If you believe, just put it in the chat that every promise of God is yes and amen. That God will do whatever he said he's going to do. We're going to study this topic of faith, but you need to understand something. It's not a, a suggestion. It's not a, oh, I'm doing it now. I'm living by faith. It's not a, you know, I just had a revelation that I need to live by faith. No, it took faith for you even to believe to become a believer. So if you were able to become a believer, just the word believer means how I live is by believing. I don't live by what I'm getting, what I'm seeing, what this world gives me. I live by that otherworldly, that spirit inside of me that connects with God. I live by that spirit. Somebody here needs to catch me. You don't need another evangelist. You don't need an apostle or a prophet or a pastor. You need to get somewhere with just you and God. Use the unction you have. And when that faith clicks in, you will know that faith is working. Romans 1, 16, 17. Understand this. Romans 1, 16, 17. Many of us don't put our faith into action because we don't try to use our faith until we need it. No. That's not oxymoronic. Listen to that. I don't put, you don't put your faith in action until you need it. That's when that little faith comes up. That's when the reality of your faith comes up, that it really wasn't faith at all. You just were going through a series or a time of, you know, good stuff happening, good luck. You had providence coming. But it does not mean it was faith, because when real situations happen, you fell apart. Your tears were greater than your word for God. Your disappointment held more sway over how you acted than what the word did. And you supposedly had been building and filling that word in your heart. Listen to Romans 1, 16, 17. Here's what Paul said to make sure you understand this. So in every area of your life, you're living for God. Romans 1, 16, 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it is, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now watch this. For herein is the righteousness, here is, herein is my right standing, the text says righteousness of God, my right standing with God, how God when I got the measure of faith, he corrected my standing in him. All has been forgiven. I'm now in the body. I'm now part of his family. I now have the authority to use his name. He said, herein is the righteousness, my right standing revealed from faith to faith. From one level of faith to the next level of faith. From one level of faith every day to the next level of faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I won't let the fact that people are clowning me because I am believing a scripture instead of working hard to make something happen. I do my work, but I still got to believe. And he said, as it is written, several places in the Bible, Galatians, I can give you the scriptures. The just shall live by faith. There's the command. I can sit here and say, well, you know, this is living by faith. No, you have been commanded to live by faith. The question is, how are you doing that? Are you putting your faith into action? Not when you're hurting. Not when your back's against the wall. I'm talking to somebody right now. Not when it looks like I got no other choice. That will work. But you have to put your faith in action. I'm going to give you some very elementary stuff now, but you need to write this down. Refresh your faith. Let your spirit get reinvigorated. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. No other way to say it. I have no faith to stand on. Sometimes 
I listen to preachers who preach a long period of message, but it's not about the word of God. It's not about a godly principle. And so you can't hear a message that's going to build your faith if it doesn't contain any word in it. You can't hear a message that's going to build your faith if it doesn't contain the word. Are you with me? If, if, so the only way I can get more faith or grow that faith or strengthen my faith or put it in action is to put some word on it. Write that in the chat. Say, I'm going to put some word on it. I'm going to put the word on it. I can put my feelings on it. I can put my disappointment on it. I can put my tears on it. But the only way I'm going to make it is put the word on it. So it's the word that allows me to put my faith in action. And God said, when I have a believer, they could have been saved for many, many years. But first Peter says, you're still a baby. That's why you're failing. That's why nothing's working. That's why you haven't been able to overcome a situation. First Peter 2 and 2 said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Although that, that analogy is so, Paul made that so plain. He's saying, as a baby is crying for that bottle, every day you ought to, you ought to be in a position where you want to grow and you want to be strengthened, and you want your faith to grow and be strengthened, but the only way your faith can grow and be strengthened is if you desire word. Faith equals more word. More word, stronger faith. More word, greater faith. We put a little word and a whole bunch of negativity. We put a little word and a whole bunch of tears. We put a little word and don't go back and reinforce it and wonder why the situation hasn't changed. I would tell you, put more word than you do worry. Put more word than you do fear. Put more word than you do crying. Put more word than you do hopelessness. Put more word than you do sitting around thinking nothing's going to work. It is the people, it is the believers, it is God's children who put the word on it and they're the ones who get blessed. If I take that same situation of going to Wildwood as a child and me and my brother and sister walking around the house getting dressed to go to Wildwood, happy, happy, happy. But we knew the word said, make your bed, make sure your room is clean. Then you go to Wildwood. If I would have walked around reinforced, you know, as the, the middle child, but the, but the oldest boy, I should have said, hey, we're going to Wildwood, but here's the word. We have to make our bed, those words. We have to make sure the house is clean. Those words would have given my parents nothing to say, no recourse when they walked in the house and it was time to go to Wildwood because I put the word on it. Somebody say put the word on it. We're talking about putting your faith into action. It's the same way with our faith. We put our faith into God to get through a challenge or trial. But later on, another harder trial comes. Eventually we find things. Here's what I found. We use our faith now because believe you me, brother and sister, it could get worse. Can I get a witness? I, I've, I've seen a situation where I would love to go back to that place than the place I'm in now. But when I was in that place, I thought it was the worst place I could be. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You've been there. It's like, wow, I, I settle for that right now over this. But if you would have taken faith at that level, when you got to the next level, your faith would have been in place to handle that level. But here's what most people do. You go back and forth, lows and highs, vacillating from, uh, I don't know why God is doing this, or vacillating into highs. He just came off a great service and you shout, did we have fun shouting all over the church? But did your faith increase? When did you put more word in you so that you could increase? You know, uh, I, I, I just know when I'm studying to preach a message, I like, I, I just love God's word all throughout my, 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 my preaching, not just the principles. I got to throw that scripture in there because it lets me know I've got a foundation I build my life on. 
Man, your, your situation is nowhere near as powerful as God is. Your situation is nowhere near as powerful what the Lord wants to do. So you need to learn that you need to live by faith. How? By putting our faith into action. So how are we going to do this? Is we're going to look at the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is an excellent book. I need you to go through it and, and look at it. But the chapter we're going to land on is chapter 11, of course, which is what we call the heroes of faith chapter. Um, people like you and me, that God showed their blemishes, their faults, their failures, and their triumphs. And God is very transparent when he talks about faith. He never, ever told you it was going to be easy. Uh, nobody told me the road was going to be easy. But I, but I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me. Nobody told you it was going to be easy. Nobody said, okay, I'm going to have to believe for a month. And then the situation is going to get better. No, you sleep on, you lay on, you live with that faith in that situation. Don't. Don't concede. Don't back up. Don't allow anything to deter you in the midst of your trial. Don't speak what you see. Speak what God says. Here's the practicality of faith. I don't have to be stupid and I don't have to be a fool to live by faith. Right? And let me explain it to you. Because somebody's saying, I always tell people, faith is not something you that lacks wisdom. You always live your faith or put your faith into action by wisdom. Meaning that um, if I know that I have a cold, the flu, it's not lessening my faith by getting flu medicine. Matter of fact, people got flu medicine and died. It's increasing my faith to believe that God is leading me, who is the creator of everything, to make that medicine so that I can be better. There's some people that tell you dumb stuff. All you got to do is believe God. Don't take the medicine. That is the silliest thing in the world. Man, God said he's the creator of all. God created man's minds and man's ingenuity and man's scientific ability. He's the one who said that that medicine would make. How about the Bible said take a little wine for stomach sake? Now, now, wait a minute now. Don't think you got that on, on, on my Bible study that I'm, I'm telling you to go drink. Oh, my God. I wish I could say all the haters and all the people who uh, talk about you are outside the church. But church folk, I did not say. I, I quoted what the Bible said. I'm trying to show you that even back then, Paul told Timothy, take a little wine. For medicine. There were remedies. There was medicine out there. We're not talking about, I'm not getting into that. I'm talking about the kind of wine we drink. I got a whole lesson on that too. But you need to understand medicine. So I pray by faith. As a matter of fact, I tell the story that I remember I got the flu. I've only had the flu really horribly one time in my life. And the flu can kill you. And I remember I was still teaching at that time. And I thought I was so strong that I didn't have to take all the medicine. So I only took Part of medicine. I felt better. I didn't take the rest. I said, I'm going back to school the next day. Of course, my wife was saying, honey, don't do that. Take the rest of your medicine. Not me. I'm going in. She dropped me off because I didn't want to drive because I was still a little shaky. She dropped me off and she was going to her place of employment after she dropped me off. I remember walking into the school. The whole room started spinning. I got rushed back to the hospital, back to the doctors. And when I went back to my doctor, my doctor said, the guy, why do you take all your medicine? And I said, Doc, I thought I was okay. He said, I gave you the I gave you the medicine and told you to take the whole script, take it all. And I remember he said to me, in this context, I'm trying to tell you, I, I don't think he violated any HIPAA rules. He said, Remember the young man that was sitting out there in the waiting room with you? About your same age, I would imagine. He died. And he took his medicine. I'm giving you the medicine hopefully to give you a chance to live. Think about that analogy. Even though you take the medicine, my faith isn't in the medicine, but I'm not a fool either. God made the medicine. Don't sit up there and act like you don't. I'm not going to the hospital. I'm just going to pray. No, call you an ambulance. I'm not going to the hospital. No, take your high blood pressure medicine. Well, I don't want to take that. It makes me feel funny. Yeah, but many of the people 
what do they call nephrologists who take care of your kidneys? Many of the kidney disease come from untreated high blood pressure. Why you walking around talking about, I'm living my faith, but every day you're full of anxiety. Killing, your blood pressure's up, you're killing the walls of your artery, and now your kidney's failing, because you won't, that's not real faith. Real faith is having enough wisdom to trust God directing and leading you in a path. I know I lost some people now, because we want to we wanna use faith as this crutch. Faith is not a crutch. Faith is a power that God gave us a power we can use to make sure we live the kind of life God said we're supposed to live. John 10.10, 10, he said, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. Abundant life means we got enough wisdom to use everything God has given us, but our faith is premier. Our faith is first place. I use my faith first, first, right? So the book of Hebrews, I don't know how I got up on that because you need to understand this book of Hebrews. It is so powerful. In the book of Hebrews, we know that the book was written by, or written to um, a group of Jewish believers. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews. We really don't know who the writer is of the book of Hebrews, but we do know it was written by somebody who believed that, or who understood that these believers, whoever his audience was that he was talking to, understood the word of God. Because he, when you look at the book, it opens up, or all through the book, it talks about the two covenants of God, right? It talks about the old covenant and new covenant. It talks about um, how Abraham came and it talks about um, the patriarchs, you know, Abraham and um, his son Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. It goes all through them and then it talks about how Moses led them out of Egypt. So it's talking someone who knows the history. It talks about the sacrifices and, and Leviticus and all of these areas. So whoever it was, they knew this book. But the book gave one area that nails it, that shows why this New Testament, this new covenant that we walk on. Now let me park there for somebody who's telling you that you know all we need is the New Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. Let me tell you right now, that's a lie. Don't fall for it. Don't believe anybody. The Bible tells us several places. I don't want to go over this again. But if you go Corinthians, it says, These things were done, Corinthians chapter 10, for your understanding and your growth. The, new, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is the part of the Bible that lets us know how powerful the New Covenant is. But God never did anything in the New Testament but enhance and build up the Ten Commandments he gave in the Old Testament by us believing and living by faith. You need to understand, guys, that when God talks about the covenant, that whole spectrum of understanding the Bible is what gives us our strength and validity. And you'll never walk in faith believing half of the Bible is true and another half is not. I heard somebody tell me that. Uh, Pastor, you shouldn't preach from the uh, Old Testament. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. Why shouldn't I preach from the Old Testament? It is the word of God. God said we need to preach his whole entire word. So the book of Hebrews talks about Jesus being more superior. Starts out with Jesus Christ. Here's where we nail it. Here's where the power comes from. It talks about Jesus being more superior. We're going to get into that. We're going to read that. And it talks about how Jesus was more superior uh, than the angels in chapter 1. And more superior um, than the sacrifices and more superior than Moses. And it goes into all of these areas showing and making, uh, bringing validation to who Jesus Christ, our Savior, is and who he was in our lives. So we're going to pick this up next week. We're going to pick up, I'm going to go through the, a little summary of each chapter, which brings us to the grand chapter of faith. And that's chapter 11. When we look at chapter 11, we're going to go down and see the principles that each one of those faithful patriarchs and those who live for God can teach us. But in the meantime, you've heard enough today to put your faith into action. I started with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? One of my favorite passages of scripture because there's many times I, I short circuit my worry. I short circuit my, my tears and my pain and my struggles and my hopelessness by just telling myself, by just continually repeating what 
This is what the proverb, what the writer of that proverb said. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's good, but lean not to your own understanding. Quit trying to figure it out. Let God work it out and put your faith into action and God will be able to do that. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Without faith, it's impossible. But those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You can't please God. I don't want to put emphasis on the word please. That's why I hesitated. You can't be in that real relationship. You know how a father is just pleased with their son. All God is saying is, look, if you don't believe me by faith, that's the beginning. That's your foundation. Please put your faith into action. We walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, you're going to love this teaching. So make sure you're with us the next few weeks. Uh, this is Pastor Duncan saying, God bless you. And let me have a word of prayer because somebody is living by faith right now. And I hope that this teaching has increased your determination to live stronger by faith. Let's pray. God, we believe everything is possible. Bar none. There's nothing outside of the realm of your possibility. Nothing is impossible with you. Everything we believe is because you make it possible. When we look at ourselves and see where you brought us from, that is a miracle in itself. The fact that I'm saved now and living for you. God, somebody listening to my voice has prayed a prayer that they need to make sure it is held up by faith. So allow them to put all of their faith in their faith through the word of God on the situation. Don't watch the situation Continually to put word on it. Continually to believe God is working it out. Continually believe that God's timing is involved. And God's going to have the last word. So in the name of Jesus, I call forth deliverance. I call forth healing. I call forth stability. I call forth peace. I call forth calmness. I call forth wisdom in a situation. I call forth more joy. I call for a home to come back together. I call for reconciliation. And I call for all of these things by faith. And lastly, I call for the desires of a believer's heart by faith. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying it's been a joy being with you. I look forward to seeing you again. Put your faith into action.